All right, so Emmett Moore from tradingschools.org did a review of me, actually. And my goal here is I want to provide you with additional information and some additional context so you guys can learn from my experiences, my mistakes, some of the good decisions, the bad decisions that I made, etc. Emmett gave me a 4.8, four stars for cost, and he liked the product so much that he asked to be an affiliate. I have tremendous respect for Emmett, and even though I don't agree with him on everything, such as the Stephen Ducks review, I agree. And uh, let's go through this review. So I offer a trading signal service, the options trade alerts, and an education product. He says that the pricing is expensive. I go the extra mile to help newbies understand my method. Tradingschools.org put me through a very difficult one-year performance test, and I performed beyond expectations. So I worked as an investment banker at CIBC World Markets. I also worked at Petsky Prunier. And then the pros and the cons. Honest, fully transparent, patient, and kind teacher. Uh, cons, do not expect to learn everything overnight, which is definitely true. It's expensive. Significant capital is required. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say significant. Students can trade spreads as opposed to naked options. And, um, and then a few personal dings. So then he goes through the products. It's definitely true that the alerts are meant for people who have more than $15,000. I get a lot of people who have a few thousand dollars and then they sign up for the alerts, for the trial for a week, or maybe they even do a month. But it is definitely not realistic for people who have like a two or $3,000 account to be persistent members of the alerts simply because they're not going to earn 10% a month trading options. I mean, you can try to earn that amount, but you're going to end up losing money by taking too much risk. Then he goes into the lion and the lamb email where a lot of people will reject the lamb. I mean, this happens all the time. In fact, it just happened today, uh, probably about an hour or two ago where, where someone sent me this email. Two questions. Can I afford to follow your trades with a $2,000 account? Does your course help you build a 2K account into a larger account? The reason I'm asking is because you have great reviews. However, a couple of comments mentioned that if you don't have a large enough account, you can't make, you can't trade the big money stocks you mentioned. And then I respond by saying, hi, no, you can't afford the alerts with $2,000. The course will help you build a small account, but the course itself is almost $2,000. My recommendation would be to enroll in the alerts trial, but then cancel immediately after. That way you get the seven days. Then perhaps book a 30 minute call, or if you really want, take the course. But if you take the course, you should make sure that you're committed because you don't want to spend $18.49 to learn a skill unless you know that selling premium is what you want to do. You can enroll in the trial here. I receive those type of emails all the time. I probably get about three or four of them every week. But the fact is that if you have $2,000 and are trying to turn it into $20,000, the probability of that happening is close to 0%. So I don't want people who have unrealistic expectations those people who have $2,000 are better off saving their money and learning a valuable skill or enrolling in the seven-day trial, but then canceling immediately afterwards. I definitely don't believe that they should spend more than 10% of their account size on trade alerts. Going back to the review, I sent Emmett actual verifiable account statements. Yep. So this is back in 2017. This account had 1.4. I think I actually posted... A statement that was later than this. I think the last statement I posted for this account had like maybe 2.2 million or maybe like 1.7. But actually, this is before I started the, the small account um, because this account just simply got too big and it gave the impression that students needed to have a very large account in order to be successful by trading options. So you can read this. In 2019, I had a really, really good year. The small account was up around 117%. The larger account was up significantly less than that, primarily because I had to deploy capital to 
suboptimal position. So instead of only investing and allocating capital to the A or the B plus opportunities, sometimes I would take some trades that were like B or potentially even C plus, and then I would end up having to roll that position, which would then tie up capital, or sometimes I would even lose a little bit of money. The win percentage in the larger account was less than the win percentage in the smaller account. In this video, I tried really hard to show you the full transaction history from inside the app. And then I also downloaded the tax document from inside Tastyworks. Now, if you look at the tax document, it's not going to show 100% win rate primarily because for the small account, I had to trade a lot of spreads. So as a result, all of the long put options or the long call options that I bought as protection were going to end up showing a loss. However, you have to recognize that you put those trades on as spreads. So if I sell a put and I collect $1.20 and then I buy a put and receive $0.40, cents, then I still receive a net credit of $0.80 cents if that position expires worthless. So on the tax document, the long put is going to show a loss, but that trade went on as a spread. So I'm counting that as a successful trade. You can watch that video if you want, it's on YouTube. All right, so now we get into the personal history. And actually I made a video on my personal history previously, and I think I'm gonna post it again. The video is a little bit old, it's probably about a year, year and a half. So I'm gonna release that video after I release this one. So I was born and raised in Monticello, New York. And Monticello, even though it was really poor, um, my dad was a doctor. You know, we did very well. My parents were, were kind of cheap, so I didn't really know where we stood relative to others. But my dad did very well. And I, I loved growing up in the Catskills primarily because there was always something to do. In the summertime, you can go jumping off cliffs and swimming in lakes. You can play basketball with your friends. And there's a lot of things to do. In the wintertime, you can go skiing. You can go tubing. It was just always something to do. The problem is that the area was very economically depressed and it really did only have 6,000 people. Some of my closest friends are from high school. Just so just today, August 24th, I had a long conversation and caught up with one of my best friends from high school. So my dad was a doctor. Yep, he was an ophthalmologist, but I don't think he wanted to be a doctor. I think that he really wanted to be an investment banker, but his father or my grandfather told my father to take the safe bet and become a doctor because he might not succeed as an investment banker. So my dad pushed me in that direction. Yep, I was rejected by Harvard, admitted to Cornell. In hindsight, I would not have gone to Cornell University if I could do it again. Instead, I would have gone to Columbia University or University of Pennsylvania. And the reason for that is I definitely would like to be in a large city because a large city affords more opportunities than being in a small town like Ithaca, New York. So had I gone to Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, I could have been much more entrepreneurial and started earning money and started businesses up at a very young age because I went to college at 17 years old. So I was in the Applied Economics and Management program at Cornell, which is in Cal's. So it's funny, the Applied Economics and Management School actually falls within the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. And there's my diploma. So then I went to Wall Street. Yep, definitely. Ivy League universities are feeder schools for some of the best banks. I interviewed at Goldman Sachs, had a final round interview, interviewed at, at Blackstone, I interviewed at CIBC, Deutsche Bank, was flown out to multiple places, Lincoln Partners in Chicago. I, I remember having a very good interview with them and um, Lazard, Rothschild, etc. So yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much, I wouldn't necessarily say that you have your pick of the litter, but at the same time, you definitely are afforded opportunities. And the primary reason for that is if you make a mistake as an Ivy League graduate, let's say you have a 4.0 GPA and you're coming out of Harvard or a 3.6 GPA coming out of Harvard, something like that. Let's say you have really good grades coming out of an Ivy League university. If you make a mistake, then the person who hired you is going to have to answer to why they gave you an opportunity. And if you had really good grades from a top-notch institution, then they can point to that and say that you excelled in college and you interviewed well. But if you come from a secondary or a second-tier college or university and you don't have the best grades, or even if you have like a 3.6 from a second-tier institution and then you fail to perform or meet expectations, then it's much harder for that person who hired you and who gave you that opportunity to validate their decision 
when you have so many students coming out from top-notch universities who have good grades. And that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult for students who are coming out who are not from top universities to be given opportunities. And the primary reason for that is that the person who's hiring you always needs to make sure that they cover their butt. So yeah, I definitely remember that interview at Blackstone. That was not fun. Ironically, one of my good friends from Cornell that I was a TA with is now a managing director at Blackstone. He's doing extremely well. Bilal Khan, he's actually brilliant, Bilal. He's probably one of the smartest kids at Cornell that I ever worked with. We are both TAs at the Applied Economics and Management Program for Professor Pedro Perez. So yeah, I was a little bit cocky, and then they stopped the interview. So CIBC World Markets, the interesting thing about CIBC was I actually completed all my coursework at CIBC in three and a half years, and I had an offer from Morgan Stanley, but that offer was going to start that summer. And I wanted to start early because I just didn't want to hang around Ithaca and just be a teacher's assistant for a few months. So with CIBC World Markets, I called them back and then I interviewed with them in New York City and then they gave me a large signing bonus and then I actually left campus. And then I actually came back a few months later to walk. So actually I left school and started working as an investment banker at CIBC on February 23rd. 2004, which I believe is a Monday, and I actually started working as an investment banker even before I officially graduated from college. Oh man, CIBC World Markets was the worst. I remember speaking with Carl Torillo and Rich Bastilli. Carl Torillo is also a great guy. He was brilliant, or he is brilliant. He's extremely successful. He's, he's one of the best analysts that I ever worked with. Very, very smart guy. Life as an investment banker at CIBC was horrible. I remember working with Jeff O'Malley. And Jeff hasn't been promoted in about 12 or 13 years. I think he's now working at Santander. And I'm definitely not surprised that Jeff hasn't been promoted, considering that he was probably the worst banker that I ever worked with. He was bipolar. He was very abusive towards the junior staff, the analysts and the associates. I remember this Apollo deal. I was working with Rich Basili and Brian Cotter on the deal. And Paul Parhar. Paul was a nice guy. I actually feel kind of bad because um, Paul gave me an opportunity. And um, we didn't necessarily have the best relationship, but I always had a lot of respect for Paul because he worked very hard and he just did a really good job. And he was he treated people well. He treated people fairly. So I definitely always had a lot of respect for Paul. So this is the exact email that Brian Cotter sent to Paul. Um, So the funny thing about this email was that Brian specifically requested a new analyst, but they never took me off that deal. And also, no one ever mentioned it. Paul Parhar never mentioned it. None of the managing directors ever mentioned it. Brian Cotter never mentioned it. And at this point, I was ready to quit because I stayed up for three straight days until three or four in the morning. I, I had a ton of stress. As well. And I think one of the things that people discount is it's not necessarily the hours because if I was working and I'm just surfing ESPN or I'm not really doing anything stressful, then I can take that. I can stay up and go on ESPN and not really do demanding work. But if you're under a lot of stress in a very demanding environment and you also don't sleep, then your body just starts to fall apart and you become extremely tired and also you become slightly paranoid. And at this point, I was ready to quit. So Brian Cotter saw this and he just sent me home because if he didn't send me home, I was just going to leave anyway. Because at that point, my body craved sleep and it just needed to get away from that situation so much that I really didn't care uh, what he said. I was just giving him common courtesy by asking him to leave. But um, I would have left anyway. So here are some investment banking stuff. It's a lot of BS. I think the funny thing about investment banking is that your work really doesn't start until after the managing directors and the directors go home. So oftentimes you'll start your work at about 8 p.m. and you'll have to be highly efficient. And during the day, you're going to be doing a lot of like commitment committee memos. You're going to be turning documents like one pagers and doing updating the comps and doing some comparable analysis, maybe working on a pitch book. But your deep work is going to start once everyone goes home. Yeah, I remember 
uh, I remember some of the meetings. We were in meetings with a lot of very wealthy and influential people. And actually, it happened at Petsky Prunier as well. We did a lot of deals with some very successful people. I remember selling Innovation Ads, which was a company started by Michael Lastoria, who owns Am Pizza and Ian Gray. They were very young at the time. I mean, I was extremely young at the time as well. And uh, that was like seed capital for Michael being able to start some of his additional entrepreneurial ventures. Here's the analysis of various prices, EBITDA, which is a surrogate for cash flow, Metallum. So what happens here is oftentimes um, we have to use a code name for the book. So this was Metals USA, and we called it Metallum because just in case like someone lost the pitch book, then we didn't want to make sure that there was proprietary information that was not public um, floating around in the public sphere. Yeah, I mean, they would definitely laugh at me if I told them that I was using technical analysis. We had a lot of interactions with equity capital markets, but we didn't have that many interactions with the actual traders themselves. So the beginning of the end, I got into an argument with Jeff O'Malley. So prior to this, I actually told Human Resources that I was going to quit unless they transferred me to another group. And just everything came to a head in December 2004, and then I transferred to financial restructuring headed by Joe Radecki in January 2004. Then what happened was because I was so efficient at getting my work done in the industrial growth and services group in financial restructuring, it was completely opposite. There just simply wasn't enough work to do. And I found myself like playing video games at work and I was getting paid the same amount. I decided to supplement my income and become a nightlife promoter. I got the idea from doing this by one of my friends who was also a Cornell alum. His name was Chris Riccioni, and he used to sign up for guest lists and then bring me out, and I thought that it was the coolest thing that you can walk into a club for free. So Chris recommended that I become a nightlife promoter. Um, I never really took it that seriously. Initially, I just did it as a way to meet new people and to meet women, but what I quickly found out was that so many people are very self-destructive in nightlife that you can be incredibly successful in nightlife. And also the money in nightlife is actually as good, if not better than it is an investment banker. <laughs> this is really funny. My personal recommendation, to Mr. Jaffe would be don't ever submit your DNA to 23andMe. <laughs> all right. So moving on nightclub. So all night party animal. The funny thing is I actually don't drink. When I started promoting in 2005, I would get very anxious because I would be pulled in so many different directions and everyone would ask me questions and I would drink a little bit, never to the point where I was drunk, but just enough where I would be good, where I would be just calm. But as I would immerse myself in nightlife and I would go out like four times a week, I didn't need to drink at all. So I started using the drink tickets and the bottle tickets as currency. For example, if someone would come out and then they would spend like $1,200, I would then comp them a free bottle as a way of showing my appreciation and gratitude for them booking their table through me. And it definitely was advantageous because I could get them comp bottles, I can get them VIP treatment, I can get them the best the best tables, etc. So it worked out for everyone. And the clubs liked working with me because I generated revenue. Sometimes I would sell 30 bottles on a Saturday night. And that's about $15,000 of revenue just in bottle sales. I will definitely say, and I'm going to touch on this more in the other video, but I made a big mistake in nightlife where I didn't establish strong relationships with people. I always consider myself an outsider and I never really took nightlife that seriously. I just looked at it as a way of meeting beautiful women and making a lot of money. But I never really, I feel like in nightlife, everyone strives to be relevant. And everyone wants to be something without actually earning it. And for me, the only reason why I was successful was because I would just outwork everyone. So I couldn't really empathize or relate to those people who just wanted to be something that they're not. For me, all the success that I had was attributed to hard work. And for those people who were like really fancy and who tried to lay claim to something that I didn't believe that they deserved, 
I would just dismiss those people and disregard them. And I didn't respect them at all. And this caused some problems. If a club didn't pay me everything that, that they should have, or if they were late with payment, or if a doorman would play games and not let some of my people in, then there were a lot of consequences because I had a very large email list because I would put them on blast and I would tell everyone on my email list what happened. And a lot of times promoters would stop working with that specific club or people would just stop going to it. All of this came at a deep personal cost after living two years on the red line of a hedonistic lifestyle. You know, I think I could have done one but I couldn't have done both. The fact is that with too much stress and burning the candle at both ends, my body just gave out. I just couldn't deal with it. So I actually quit investment banking and I walked away from being a nightclub promoter. The reason was um, I always knew that I could make more money as long as I was healthy, but at this time I wasn't healthy and I made a lot of money in my early 20s and my mid 20s, but I still felt miserable I was extremely depressed. I was sleeping like 20 hours a day. So I didn't really, what's the point of having a ton of money if you can't enjoy it, if you're miserable, if you feel like crap? As a result, I, I just walked away. I, I just gave it up and I just focused on myself. And I, would, I went traveling. I met some great people. I just really worked a lot on trying to become healthy again. I uh, did a lot of saunas, went to the gym, took a lot of supplements, so I stopped taking any type of pharmaceutical drug for anxiety, for depression, and I just did everything natural. And actually, I haven't taken anything in about 10 years, and I feel really good. All right, so the hostels. Yeah, I, I like the energy of the hostels. I traveled a lot, and I would frequently stay in hostels just as a way of meeting people, and some of them were better than others. The problem with hostels was that they would essentially have to accept everyone, what I thought I could do in New York City was replicate that, but be extremely selective and only select the best people who I perceived would add to a positive dynamic inside the apartment. And I got the idea from staying at a place in Rio de Janeiro. I think it was in Ipanema. It was, I forgot what the hostel was called, but I think it was below the place like uh, where the guy wrote a girl from Ipanema or something like that. It was really, really nice. And I met some amazing people while staying there. And that's actually what spawned the idea of going back to New York City and starting it. Yeah, definitely true. At this time, Airbnb was just getting started up. It was very controversial. There really weren't any rules. I did both. I did the upscale hostels and I did the the regular hostels, the more budget hostels. And yeah, as I got healthier, I definitely brought things to the extreme. Yeah, I remember this. So this was funny. What happened was um, March 21st, 2015, which I believe was a Saturday, the New York City Department of Buildings actually snuck someone into the apartment. And I interviewed this person at Starbucks. I was very close to rejecting them, and obviously I should have. And then the next Monday, on, on March 23rd, 2015, I remember I was the only person home at the time. They came at around 12.20 and um, they knocked on the door. They had a vacate order and the guys were really nice to me. They actually sat me down and they said, hey, uh, this is game over. You have to shut down all the units because we're going to find them and then we're just going to get warrants and break them up. And they told me that I need to find something else to do. I asked them for six weeks so that I can wrap everything up. They're human. And as long as they trust that you're going to do the right thing, then they're not going to come after you and try to create something out of nothing. I definitely don't think that they enjoyed throwing people out on the street. And as a result, they allowed me to fold up the operations. And within just a few weeks, everything was done. I definitely don't think that it was smart to open up a nightclub. At this time, I was like 10 years older than I was in my very early 20s, and I just didn't really enjoy it. In fact, I was barely ever there. The only thing I helped with was to book some events, um, plus I didn't drink, and plus we definitely made some mistakes because we opened it up in a residential area, plus I didn't like New York City anymore, and I was starting to dream about leaving and live somewhere else. 
after about a year, I realized I didn't, actually, I, I kind of realized I didn't enjoy it from like the first few weeks. I just didn't like being there. The weird thing was we, we actually had an opportunity to open up a club in Midtown. Uh, I think it was like 38 West 39th Street. It would have been very, very successful. I definitely don't regret it, primarily because I'm really happy not living in New York City. In New York City, people are very stressed out. It's a lot of pressure. The city is old. There's a lot of infrastructure. Now, yeah, there are a lot of jobs in New York City, but I wasn't really happy there. New York City was very good to me, but at the same time, it just wasn't, it was just time for a change. So then I moved to Miami. Yep. I was making a lot of money by trading, but I was really bored. I remember thinking that I can do so much more and I was actually pretty lonely because my wife didn't understand trading and I was only making about two or three trades every single week. And the rest of the time, I really wasn't doing anything because when you sell option premium, you don't have to obsessively watch the price action. So I found myself like just being really bored. And then my wife actually suggested that I start Best Stock Strategy. How did I come up with the name? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I felt like Best Option Strategy might have been better, but I also felt like it's kind of like the stock market, but I also felt like Best Stock Market Strategy would be too long. All right. So then I started Best Stock Strategy and similar to investment banking, similar to nightlife, similar to running the apartments. I really didn't think much of it in the beginning. You know, I, I figured that I would just have a few students, but then it became very successful. My wife was looking for something part-time and she made the fatal mistake of going to Google. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, my wife gave me the idea. She still reminds me of that. All right, that's the end of part one. Let's start part two. Yeah, sometimes I can be arrogant. It's a flaw of mine. I think one of the issues that I have is I don't respect people who are self-destructive and I perceive day traders to be self-destructive. And as a result, I can be quite rude when they leave comments or they claim to make money. And then I always ask them for their statements, but then they never provide them. Or actually, that's that's not true. Sometimes they do provide them, but they're lying or they'll send screenshots or they'll send statements from an illegitimate brokerage or they'll send statements that doesn't actually show that they day trade or that they've actually lost money. So when I get so many comments from people on YouTube saying that, that they make money, but then when you ask them for proof, they don't provide it. Really, the only people who make money on YouTube as day traders, they're front running their subscribers. So they aggregate everyone into a chat room and then they just give them an alert and then um, they just pump and dump and they take the subscribers or the followers money. But yeah, I definitely agree. You know, I can be arrogant and I apologize for that. And it's something that I'm working on. You know, and I really don't mean to hurt anyone, so I apologize for that. And you're definitely right. All right, let's go on to part two.